Yes, now we okay. see the file, but not in the presentation mode. Okay, start in presentation yeah. mode. Yeah. Now you can see in presentation mode? Unfortunately, no. No. I don't know, but so we can try it different. You can see this PDF file? You can see the PDF file? Uh, no, you have to stop sharing the PPT uh, if you want to show something else. Okay, you can see this PDF file? Yes, now we can see the PDF file. You can see now in presentation mode? Yes, now it's good. Okay. Perfect. Always have a plan B. <laughs> That's good for so, you. <clears throat> uh, so I don't know, as we know, during cardiogenic shock, there is a reduced contractility. This uh, will affect the end diastolic volume. We have an increase in the end diastolic volume and a reduced stroke volume, which will go further to a reduced perfusion during the cardiogenic shock. So there is a few steps during the cardiogenic shock. During the first injury, we have a reduced contractility, a reduced stroke volume, increase in the end diastolic volume, but the uh, systems try to fight back and in an, uh, by a neurohormonal activation, adrenergic activation, and tries to increase the cardiac output by increasing the heart rate and causing vasoconstriction. But instead of increasing the perfusion and increasing the stroke volume, we have in the other side an increase of movement. The, from the volume for not an unstress compartment to an stress compartment. This will mean that the end diastolic volume on the left, like left ventricle will increase further and it will increase again than the afterload and will reduce even more the stroke volume. So when we are here and we already mm -hmm. use the inotropes and now we need to move forward and help the heart to uh, rest during this uh, physiopathological process. And we need then to take the control of the perfusion. And there is when comes the, the ECMO. Don't forget the right ventricle. During the cardiogenic shock of, as well, the right ventricle function is impaired. Here we can see in large blue is the loop of the right ventricular function, pressure and volume. And in the orange, how is the right ventricular function during the cardiogenic shock? As well, there is a decrease in contractility, a decrease in the stroke volume, an increase in the right uh, ventricular and diastolic volume, and a decrease in the right uh, in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So, if we compare with shock, cardiogenic shock is usually uh, characterized by the high feeling pressure a high end diastolic volume, a high vascular resistance, which <clears throat> depending of where we are, the mean arterial pressure can be high, normal, or low. Because we have a low perfusion, we can have a slow central venous saturation. When we assess the echocardiography, we will have a dilated cardiac chamber, and this is because the increase on the F diastolic volume, Empire contractility, of course, and clinical sign of low perfusion, as well as uh, increased uh, end diastolic volume uh, with uh, long edema and jugular vein distension. Okay, we, we have patients with cardiogenic shock. We uh, place the patient into a uh, vein arterial ECMO, and what happened to the heart? Uh, the via ECMO is a, a bridge for recovering the patient a bridge to transplant and a bridge for further medical support, a bridge for the to recovery. So what happened when we are placing the uh, via ECMO? As you can see here in the right slide, we have again the pressure volume loops for the right ventricle in the top and for the left ventricle in the downward. We see like that uh, the line is moving, the loop is moving to the left as we increase the ECMO flow. And why is so? Because we can, uh, we need to think the ECMO flow as a different cardiac output. So as we increase the uh, 
uh, oxygenated uh, ECMO flow, we're increasing an external cardiac output and we'll be get higher than the heart cardiac output, which is already sick. So we will see that the uh, increasing in the ECMO will decrease the pulse pressure and will decrease the stroke volume, left ventricular stroke volume, as we see externally. We can measure this by ultrasound because uh, echocardiography, but as worse heart, as low the stroke volume. So to improve perfusion, we increase the ECMO uh, support and we will in decrease the, we will see a decrease in the pulse pressure. So again, the end of this hemodynamic monitoring, the hemodynamic uh, uh, support is to obtain a adequate perfusion. So again, is give the oxygen supply that we need in patient with a shock. And you see from the previous uh, uh, presentation, I changed this slide. Now we have a systemic oxygen delivery and we have ECMO oxygen delivery. Here we have in the systemic oxygen delivery, we have an empire heart rate, empire contractility because of the cardiogenic shock. So we need to uh, change or we need to assess this cardiac output by supplying uh, external output from the ECMO that will give oxygen again to a certain rate of a certain flow. And the mixing of these two oxygen uh, transport will give us the total oxygen transport to give an adequate perfusion. And, and uh, again, I'm moving forward. We need to measure hemodynamics to know where are we, what we need, where we need to go and how, what is precision medicine is to measure all the variables we can to understand the physiology, to understand the physiopathology and to know how to more uh, precisely react to this uh, uh, hemodynamic status. Now it's almost the same like that before, but you will see the difference. Not every patient is the same because the physiopathology is not the same. So when we are in VA ECMO, how we can assess afterload? First is the diastolic pressure. Keep it simple. The diastolic pressure is a good, have good correlation with left ventricular afterload. But in the case of VA ECMO, the mean arterial pressure is a really, really important parameter about afterload. Why? Because we are controlling externally the cardiac output. And as the mean arterial pressure is the product of the cardiac output and the systolic, systemic vascular resistance, if we know the cardiac output because we are giving it with the, with the ECMO, we will assess the mean arterial pressure as the vascular resistance. As we increase the flow with the ECMO, we will increase vascular resistance as well. Contractility is really important. We have a sick heart. So we, we, have, we need to assess the difference between the cardiac output of the heart and the flow we are giving externally to the, with the VA ECMO in order to know how much support need this patient. We can assess by the difference of the ECMO flow and the cardiac output, and we can know what percent of uh, support need these patients. The cardiac output uh, gives a value on time to know if the heart is worsening or if improving. Another parameter is the cardiac power index, which is not only about, is a really good parameter uh, of contractility of the left ventricle. The left ventricular ejection fraction helps really much in the follow up. And in this case, I put here the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is giving you bedside which is the uh, cardiac contractility status really easily. As increase in the, uh, of the pulse pressure, we means uh, the left ventricular is recovering. If the pulse pressure is reducing, means the left ventricular function is worsening. Why? We know that the pulse pressure is the product of the heart beating and the vascular system. We will see the waves in the monitor. If we are giving one external flow and the cardiac output is reducing, 
we will start seeing more flat waves in the screen. And as the heart recovers and it starts pulsating again strongly and strongly, this will gain away, uh, gain away the normal uh, pulse like we used to see in normal patients. So monitoring the pulse pressure in these patients is really important and it's at the bedside. You can do it continuously by uh, uh, an arterial line and it's really easy to assess. Please do not forget the right ventricle. We see in cardiogenic shock, there is an increase in the end diastolic volume and this means a high risk for right ventricular failure. Not every patient with uh, cardiogenic shock will go to right ventricular failure, but patients who de develop right ventricular pressure have higher mortality than those who doesn't. So we need to take care of the right ventricle and check uh, if there is a possibility of right ventricular failure, control really good of intratoracic pressure, control the preload in order to uh, give rest as well to the right ventricle. Again, how to assess right ventricular function, that's uh, the fractional area change, like ven uh, right ventricle to left ventricular diameter, and the TAPS uh, uh, and uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Perfusion, we have again the same parameters, and the change is I, I'm writing more here about the mean arterial pressure. Uh, I will not repeat the same. The mean arterial pressure is the product with the, from the cardiac output and the systemic vascular resistance. So the mean arterial pressure will give you uh, a follow-up about what's happening with the cardiac output. An increase in the flow will increase the mean arterial pressure will help to improve perfusion in these patients. The near-infrared spectrometry helps you uh, monitoring not only cerebral blood flow, but also perfusion and perfusion in the low extremities. If we are using peripheral via ECMO, we have an increased risk of uh, limb is injury, limb, limb ischemia. So we need to monitor how is peripheral perfusion and we can use the near-infrared spectrometry. During output, again, it's really uh, easy parameter to measure is on the bedside, but we need to take into account if the patient have a chronic kidney disease and if there is another parameter that, that can affect the monitoring of the urine output. The lactate uh, uh, is a nice biomarker for perfusion. It helps us in the time to assess what are we doing to the patient. If we have an initial lactate of three or four, and we increase uh, the ECMO flow, or we are giving uh, fluids to the patient, or we are giving vasopressor to the patient, and we see that lactate is not reducing. So we need to assess, again, hemodynamic to know what's happening. I'm giving vasopressor when the patient really needs uh, fluids, or I'm giving fluid when the patient really needs vasopressor, or I'm giving fluid when the patient really needs is an increase in the VA ECMO flow. So like they help you in the follow-up of your therapy. Central venous oxygen uh, uh, is again, really good parameter for perfusion, but you need to take into account that this parameter, you cannot uh, see it alone. You need to compare with other parameters like the arterial venous and the oxid uh, gap. And CRT as kit modeling, really good on the bedside, really easy to perform, but you cannot use only one parameter. Again, hemodynamics and critical care is about to review the physiology of the patient, the physiopathology, and as much you can measure, as better picture you will have. Preload, different in uh, uh, VA ECMO, the CVP can be a really good tool to predict uh, right ventricular uh, dysfunction because if you connect your patient and the initial CVP is around seven and you see the next hour, your CVP is rising to 13, then you need to assess the right ventricular dysfunction and think into venous congestion. Right ventricular end diastolic area or left ventricular end diastolic area is a, are really good tools. Uh, this page, remember that the patient's uh, shock we have an increase in the end diastolic volume. So these two parameters initially will be high. And uh, with the recovery of the left ventricle, you will see that these parameters start going down. In the case of the inferior vena cava, 
now we have a difference during IRDS. Uh, first, we needed to assess that if you have high intrathoracic pressure, you cannot mesh, you cannot use inferior vena cava to assess preload. But in this case, if you are cannulating the patient uh, via ECMO, the cannula will be through the pair of vena cava to the uh, right atrium. So this will give phase negatives because you will have there the cannula. Preload responsiveness as well, we have some uh, changes. Uh, when you are uh, have the patient on vena arteria edmo, usually you have a long protective ventilation. During long protective ventilation, we have a, a, a low tidal volume, a low transpulmonary pressure. So these low variations in the pulmonary pressure may lose the ability for these two parameters to predict uh, uh, volume responsiveness. So be careful in, when we are using the PPV or the SVV for preload responsiveness. First challenge. We move forward to the inferior vena cava collapsibility index. So as we said before, we have one cannula in the inferior vena cava. Again, this may lose the, the ability to predict volume responsiveness due, due to the ECMO cannula. Now, uh, moving to the passive leg rising. Passive leg rising is a root parameter to assess volume responsiveness. But we have a patient with tubes and cannulas everywhere. We have two in the legs. We have maybe one or two in the neck. We have the patient in mechanical ventilation. So how you move these patients? Mm, it can be a really challenging to measure using passive leg rising. There is a uh, table uh, we can use the physio uh, physiological limit is to remind us which are the limitations from some uh, uh, volume responsive parameters. The L is for long protective ventilation or low tidal volume, which may reduce the ability for the uh, pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation to measure volume responsiveness. The E is for the intracentral venous ECMO cannulas, which will reduce the ability for the inferior vena cava collapsibility index to measure volume responsiveness. Mechanical circulatory support, if you are using extra like uh, impella for uh, unload the left ventricle, this also may reduce the ability for pressure variation and stroke volume variation. The emotion and the amount of cannula this patient have may reduce or be, make challenging the use of passive leg rising to assess uh, volume responsiveness. And the two for tube and circuits because we are uh, giving flow and this flow have uh, some difference in temperature will uh, reduce the possibility of measure cardiac output using some uh, monitors. So how we assess volume responsiveness if we have all these challenges. What do we do with this patient? So there's a tool, this uh, article is really new, it's really beautiful, when uh, they demonstrate that we can do like kind of passive leg rising by uh, positioning the, the patient first in anti-trend Allenburg with the head that in plus 15 degrees and after in the opposite minus 15 degrees, the whole bed, and we can measure the cardiac output variability by ultrasound, or we can measure, and this will give you a volume responsiveness in, in this patient. And now, tool of monitorization, we have difference as well in the patient with VA ECMO. The first two are the pulmonary artery catheter and the term, uh, transpulmonary thermal dilution. There, ha, there is a huge problem with these two and is for the measurement of the cardiac output. As they are using thermal dilution to measure in cardiac output, and we are giving some fluids in with a, uh, special changes in temperature. Uh, so the cardiac output measuring can be in the, with these two uh, motors, but they still really uh, good for measuring, for example, preload or for measuring global end diastolic volume. Another problem, if uh, we are using the transpulmonary thermal dilution, the PICO monitor, which uh, measure the cardiac output by uh, the area under the pulse pressure, uh, the area under the stroke volume, this can be challenging as well in patients with cardiac uh, uh, shock, uh, cardiogenic shock, and VA ECMO, because we are giving a, uh, f back flow, which is shocked with the uh, 
uh, flow coming for the heart and it will not be too uh, accurate the measure of these parameters. So what are we using? Don't say, okay, well, let's go to non-invasive. We have a patient again. If we are using the arterial post wave analysis and we have a pulseless patient because of the cardiogenic shock, we are giving 70, 80% of support with the VA ECMO, so we will not see pulse. So the, uh, this monitor can measure cardiac output. As well, there's a huge changes in the arterial phone, given the change in the afterload we're used, uh, given by the change in the flow with the ECMO or using vasopressors. And as, again, this will not uh, help uh, to these monitors which are uncalibrated. So what we'll be using? Ultrasound. Ultrasound, I think, is the best tool you have in the ICU to measure, to follow, and to uh, know what to do and where we are with this patient. Again, it's, uh, I think it's a tool everyone has to know, everyone has to understand, and everyone has to perform as times as necessary in your patient at the bedside. It's cheap, uh, you can measure preload, afterload, contractility, preload responsiveness, you can calculate the, after the, the uh, perfusion of the patient, you can calculate which are the amount of support you are giving. And the only downside are it's not continuously. We still don't have something, uh, chest equipment you can put measuring the ultrasound, the echocardiography 24 seven. Maybe some, someday we will have. Uh, is high the operator dependent and is high acoustic window dependent. So when we have a patient with a severe pulmonary edema, a patient with a chronic uh, pulmonary disease, a patient with a high PEEP or a patient uh, uh, with a, a body mass index massive, so it will be challenged to get an appropriate acoustic window to measure all these parameters. Some special issues with the VE ECMO, the live ventricle distension is, uh, uh, again, we have an increase in uh, end diastolic volume. This means that we are, the native flow is decreased, so we need to increase the ECMO flow, and we can monitor using the echocardiography, we can monitor using the pulmonary artery catheter by measuring the PAWP. Uh, we will say, we will see in the arterial wave waveform that the pulse pressure is reduced. In the chest rate, we can see pulmonary edema, and in the lung ultrasound, we will see an increase in the pulmonary edema as well. We have the Harlequin syndrome, which is a decrease in the perfusion, and we can this measure using the near infrared spectrometry. We can use uh, sa um, uh, peripheral saturation or arterial blood gases to monitor in this complication. And the limb ischemia is because of decrease of the perfusion and decreasing the uh, peripheral flow. And that's why we need to assess the pools in the uh, peripheral flow. We need to assess or by uh, peripheral saturation or using the uh, uh, near infrared spectrometry or using again the ultrasound to see how is the flow in the peripheral uh, uh, limb. As you can see, there is some variation. Every patient is different. So we need to adapt or uh, uh, hemodynamic monitoring according to this pathology, but we need to measure the uh, monitorization of the patient on the VA ECMO or on the any condition in the, in the ICU must be objective and must be multimodal. And uh, hemodynamic, this we are presenting here is just uh, watching by the keyhole, there is much more beautiful hemodynamics to learn to see and to compare. And thank you again for your attention.